Welcome to episode 176 of Reclaiming the Faith. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen. Today, we'll be looking at the martyrdom of Justin from the second century AD. You can find links to all of my resources at philsbaker.com. And I really want to encourage you to go check out our Spotify channel and leave a rating and review there uh, on Reclaiming the Faith. And uh, also do that for our Apple Podcast channel as well. You can check out my catalog of podcasts for my show, The Faithful Podcast with Stephanie Baker. And I've got a new book, The Final Abominable Temple, which you can purchase in audio, digital, hardback, and paperback formats on Amazon. And if you've read it, please consider leaving a review there as well. And finally, we are blessed to be a part of Omega Frequency. And you can find links to all of our content there at omegafrequency.com. All right, let's get into episode 176. All right, Steph, we finished our series on 1 Thessalonians, and now we're getting into an ancient document about the the martyrdom of the guy known as Justin Martyr. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I'm excited to go through this with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Folks, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to give a an introduction on the document, mm-hmm. a little bit on Justin, not a whole lot. And uh, then we're going to read it. And it kind of reads like a play. So as we go along, I'm going to be playing the part of the narrator and of the prefect known as Rusticus. All right? So Stephanie will read all of the lines from Justin and his friends. And then once we're done going through the document, uh, word for word, it's not very long, um, then we'll talk about it for a few minutes, give some of our uh, reactions. All right? Sounds good. Yeah. So, Justin Martyr. He was a Gentile. He's born in Samaria, uh, probably near Jacob's Well. He was probably very well educated. He had gotten around a lot, traveled a lot, and uh, he seems to be a disciple of Socrates and Plato. Um, We know the main facts from Justin's life from his writings, but there are not a lot of clues to the dates. But it's agreed upon that he lived in the time of Antonius Pius and uh, Eusebius, says that he suffered martyrdom at the reign during the reign of Marcus Aurelius around 165 or 166 AD. Uh, Justin is very well known for his first and second apologies uh, and his dialogue with Trypho the Jew. I'm a huge fan of it. Probably we'll get into some of these documents eventually mm-hmm. because... Uh, I really like the dude. Yeah. Now, we mentioned this word prefect. The guy that Justin and his buddies are going to be interacting with, this prefect named Rusticus, uh, the, the title prefect was given to Pontius Pilate in the inscription from Caesarea um, Mamertime or Caesarea by the Sea. So this Pilate inscription which is very famous because some people think, you know, the whole gospel stuff is made up. And yet you have this pilot inscription uh, from clearly the first century, from the time of pilot, that talks about pilot mm. being the prefect um, of Judea. Now, this word prefect, therefore, um, if he was the prefect of Judea, the Bible says that pilot was the governor of Judea. So that's one way to look at it, that he is a governor. Um, yeah. So um, just keep that in mind. These people had the power, these prefects like Pilate had the ability to put people to death. Okay. So Justin and uh, his buddies during the time of Marcus Aurelius um, were being pressured to worship the Roman gods, okay? And, of course, they couldn't do that. 
if they're going to follow Jesus. So you have this decision to make. Should I keep my life now and then lose it for eternity? Or should I be willing to not deny Jesus and face death, knowing that in Christ, there's resurrection, there's hope, there's reward, there's an inheritance that can never sp- never fade or spoil. And um, actually, I'm, I'm very safe dying with Christ. Mm-hmm. That's the safest thing in this situation. All right. Well, are you ready, Steph? I think so. All right. So chapter one begins. This is the examination of Justin by the prefect. In the time of the lawless partisans of idolatry, Wicked decrees were passed against the godly Christians in town and country to force them to offer libations to vain idols. And accordingly, the holy men, having been apprehended, were brought before the prefect of Rome, Rusticus by name. And when they had been brought before his judgment seat, said to Justin, "'Obey the gods at once.'" and submit to the kings. Justin said, To obey the commandments of our Savior Jesus Christ is worthy neither of blame nor of condemnation. Rusticus the prefect said, What kind of doctrines do you profess? And Justin said, I have endeavored to learn all doctrines, but have acquiesced at last in the true doctrines, those namely of Christians even though they do not please those who hold false opinions. Rusticus the prefect said, Are those the doctrines that please you, you utterly wretched man? And Justin said, Yes, since I adhere to them with right dogma. Rusticus the prefect said, What is the dogma? And Justin said, That according to what which we worship, the God of the Christians whom we reckon to be one from the beginning, the maker, the fashioner of whole creation, visible and invisible, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who had also been preached beforehand by the prophets as about to be present with the race of men, the herald of salvation and teacher of good disciples. And I, being a man, think that what I can say is insignificant in comparison with his boundless divinity, acknowledging a certain prophetic power, since it was prophesied concerning him, of whom now I say that he is the Son of God. For I know that of old the prophets foretold his appearance among men. Chapter 2. Examination of Justin continued. Rusticus the prefect said, Where do you assemble? And Justin said, Where each one of us chooses and can. For do you fancy that we all meet in the very same place? Not so, because the God of the Christians is not circumscribed by place, but being invisible fills heaven and earth and everywhere is worshiped and glorified by the faithful. Rusticus the prefect said, Tell me where you assemble. Or into what place do you collect your followers? And Justin said, I live above one Martinus at the Timotinian bath, and during the whole time, and I am now living in Rome for the second time, I am unaware of any other meeting than his. And if any one wished to come to me, I communicated to him the doctrines of truth. Rusticus said, Are you not then a Christian? And Justin said, Yes, I am a Christian. Chapter 3. Examination of Keraton and Others Then said the prefect Rusticus to Keraton, Tell me further, Keraton, are you also a Christian? And Keraton said, I am a Christian by the command of God. Rusticus the prefect asked the woman, Kerito, What do you say, Carito? And Carito said, I am a Christian by the grace of God. And Rusticus said to Eulpistus, And what are you? Eulpistus, a servant of Caesar, answered, 
I too am a Christian, having been freed by Christ, and by the grace of Christ I partake of the same hope. Rusticus the prefect said to Hierax, And you, are you a Christian? And Hierax said, Yes, I am a Christian, for I revere and worship the same God. Rusticus the prefect said, Did Justin make you Christians? And Hierax said, I was a Christian, and I will be a Christian. And Paeon stood up and said, I too am a Christian. Rusticus the prefect said, Who taught you? And Paeon said, From our parents we received this good confession. Eulpistus said, I willingly heard the words of Justin, but from my parents also I learned to be a Christian. And Rusticus said, Where are your parents? Eulpistus said, In Cappadocia. Rusticus said to Hierax, Where are your parents? And he answered and said, Christ is our true father, and faith in him is our mother. And my earthly parents died. And I, when I was driven from Iconium in Phrygia, came here. And Rusticus the prefect said to Liberianus, And what say you? Are you a Christian and unwilling to worship the gods? And Liberianus said, I too am a Christian, for I worship and reverence the one and only true God. Chapter 4. Rusticus threatens the Christians with death. The prefect says to Justin, Hearken, you who are called learned and think that you know true doctrines. If you are scourged and beheaded, do you believe you will ascend into heaven? And Justin said, I hope that. If I endure these things, I shall have his gifts. For I know that to all who have thus lived, there abides the divine favor until the completion of the whole world. Rusticus the prefect said, Do you suppose then that you will ascend into heaven and receive some recompense? And Justin said, I do not suppose it, but I know and I'm fully persuaded of it. Rusticus the prefect said, let us then now come to the matter in hand, and which presses, having come together, offer sacrifice with one accord to the gods. And Justin said, No right-thinking person falls away from piety to impiety. Rusticus the prefect said, Unless you obey, you will be mercilessly punished. And Justin said, through prayer, we can be saved on account of our Lord Jesus Christ, even when we have been punished, because this shall become to us salvation and confidence at the more fearful and universal judgment seat of our Lord and Savior. Thus also said the other martyrs, Do what you will, for we are Christians and we do not sacrifice to idols. Chapter 5. Sentence pronounced and executed. Rusticus the prefect pronounced a sentence saying, Let those who have refused to sacrifice to the gods and to yield to the command of the emperor be scourged and led away to suffer the punishment of decapitation according to the laws. The holy martyrs, having glorified God and having gone forth to the accustomed place, were beheaded and perfected their testimony in the confession of of the Savior. And some of the faithful, having secretly removed their bodies, laid them in a suitable place, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ having wrought along with them, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. So that was the martyrdom of Justin. Um, hope y'all enjoyed that. We're going to respond to it a little bit now. So, like, Steph, what are your some of your just reactions to that? Some of your general thoughts on that? Um, well, I think there's there's a lot there. It's just this this peace that's so evident in these followers of Jesus. It's like, you know, they are on trial for their life, and they're willing to not only boldly declare it, but like 
you know, the one the one individual payon, he's not even being asked. I guess he's just in the crowd and he just stands up and says that I too am a Christian. And it's just I mean, the, their courage is inspiring others to stand up. And um, I mean, I've read through this several times now, but I guess one thing that really struck me this last time is in the last chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I was just being really struck by this. It says, Rusticus, the prefect, announced the sentence saying, let those who have refused to sacrifice to the gods and to yield to the command of the emperor be scourged and led away to suffer. It's It was really striking. Kind of in our culture, we see a lot of times Christians are seen as like intolerant um, or, you know, we're closed-minded. But like this is completely flipped script. Like they... They're like, you're not going to worship what we worship. We're going to kill you. I mean, I guess that's kind of what the Crusades were, but that was not what Jesus wanted. That was never the design um, that Jesus was about. Um, But in the attempt to to stifle and to bring down what's happening in the body of Christ, like it's growing Mm -hmm. and it's inspiring more people to come along and follow. But yeah, there was... There's a lot there, and it's just and this idea of like martyrdom being perfection mm. is pretty different than you know we usually think of it somebody having to to die for their faith. We don't think of that as like you know this ultimate sacrifice. This is not. This is very different than like you know certain other religions that may have this idea of martyrdom. Like you're bringing down as many people with you as possible. You're destroying people in the process. This is willingly laying down your life, being bold, being courageous, you know, accepting what, you know, the punishment for being a follower of Jesus. This is not, I'm trying to kill people in the process, but yeah. yeah. So. That's yeah. awesome. Um, so I'm going to hit like uh, one or two things from each chapter. Okay. And just as I do, if you got a response, go for it. Okay. So one of the things I thought was really neat in the first chapter is that they are brought before the judgment seat of Rusticus and told to obey the gods and submit to the king. And at the very end, in chapter four, uh, Justin flips that. So he says you are not the king that I'm supposed to obey and your judgment seat is not the actual judgment seat that I need to be uh, reverent toward. So in chapter four, when Rusticus comes back to the very end and he says, you know, you're going to obey or you're going to be mercilessly punished. Mm -hmm. Justin does the call back and he says, Through prayer, we can be saved on account of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Caesar's not Lord. Caesar doesn't save. Jesus does. And he goes, even when we've been punished, because this shall become to us salvation and confidence at the more fearful Mm. and universal judgment seat of our Lord and Savior. So he brought back what what Rusticus said Mm -hmm. early on. And uh, I just thought that was really, really cool. And he's using language that is commonly ascribed to Caesar. Um, And uh, like in the Priene inscription uh, that was found in the uh, like 6 AD 6 or something like that, I believe it is that uh, Caesar is called the Lord and Savior of the world that brings good news. So that's common language that's ascribed to Caesar. And Justin is like, nope, that's wrong. What were you going to say? Um, yeah, I just think like that first paragraph, I he's got a couple of like little burns in there, you mm. know? <laughs> yeah. Like the last sentence, uh, I've endeavored to learn all the doctrines, but I have acquiesced at, at last in the tr- true doctrines, namely those of the Christians, even though they do not please those who hold false opinions. Yeah, It's just like... He's so 
direct, but also sounds like polite, I guess, in the process. He's not, he's, he's being disrespectful, but it's only in the sense he's not trying to just insult, you know, these government, this government leader. He's trying to elevate Jesus. So, you know, it's not, it's not just, you know, taking him down a notch for the sake of that. It's, you know, with a purpose. Yeah, it's it's very akin to Paul in uh, at Mars Hill because he's looking around at all of these idols and then he preaches Romans 1 stuff. He's like, you should not be worshiping all these different gods. You should be worshiping the creator of all things, the maker of all things. Mm-hmm. Don't worship created beings. Mm-hmm. Worship the ultimate creator. And that's what Justin comes to, just like Paul. Uh, worship the one from the beginning, the maker and fashioner of the whole creation, visible and invisible. Talking about these gods that Rustigus is saying for them to worship. I mean, Justin's like, why would I worship a created thing? You know, for some, for some of our friends who uh, we do have friends that are like Latter Day Saint, you know, Mormons, in their doctrine. They have this um, this teaching from, I believe it's the King Follett Discourse that says, as man is, God once was. And as God is, man can become. And what that's saying about the Mormon God is that the Mormon God Elohim, who they call Heavenly Father, was at one time a created being. He was a man. Mm-hmm. As man is, God once was. Yeah. And so when I try to talk to Mormons, when they come to my door, this is what I've found is the most important argument for them, which is kind of like what Justin is doing. Justin doesn't go into like the whole gospel message with Rusticus. God, Justin goes to who is the one true God? Who is the ultimate creator? Because that's who we're supposed to worship. And that's what I feel like is most important with when we're talking to Latter-day Saints people is are you really worshiping the creator of all things? Because if you're not, then you're worshiping a creation. Mm. And Paul says in Romans 1, that's idolatry. Right. So it's cool that Justin's going this way because that's Rusticus' first problem. He's got to get to who is God. Who is the only one that we should be worshiping? And Justin's like, that's Jesus. So, uh, chapter two, they start uh, being asked where where they assemble, where do they have church? And um, one of the uh, the things that stuck out to me uh, is that their their meeting places are just these tiny little rooms. Justin's like, I don't know any other place than my place, which is right above the bath, the Timotean bath. And uh, if people want to come and listen, that's cool. Mm. But it's kind of like a little apartment space. And this is the church at Rome. This is one of the big boys. You know, Smyrna's pretty popular. Um, Antioch. Ephesus, these are some of the more popular places, but Rome is like one of the big boys. Mm -hmm. And Rome, (laughs) their churches are little small rooms. Right. And during this time of persecution, they can't like all of the Christians in Rome get together at a central location, most likely, based on what Justin's saying. They're just having church. So like... Justin may not have been like an overseer, but he's leading meetings. Mm-hmm. And that's cool. Yeah, it's so interesting. This is this tiny gathering, and yeah. it's so threatening to mm. the government that they're like, we need to put these people to death. Like, they are going, they're causing so much, you know, chaos mm. in our in our society, we need to get rid of them. And they're just this little gathering of people also like kind of, uh, I mean, this is like a random a random thought, but like 
you and I have like watched stuff about like Scientology and like how Scientology is uh, kind of like this, um, they are acquiring properties for power. Like they have these, you know, big pieces of land that, you know, are very valuable. And it's like the way that the church was started, like the Christian church is there's nobody own there's the church itself does not own any property it's some individuals who donate their space as a place to gather and to congregate and you know when justin will eventually you know when he's going to lose his life probably one of the people from his gathering is going to be one that assumes that role and it can just continue on and this you know they would it, it's it's not limited because they have to gather in this really conspicuous place. They're able to, you know, just be living in their community and learning about Jesus. Yeah, that's good. Um, chapter three. Sometimes in these stories, it it's definitely argued that people's names uh, are chosen by the writer not not by the parents of the person. Mm. So it's kind of like the writer of the document is trying to communicate a truth. I don't know. But like Keraton and uh, Kerito, um, the Keraton is like, it leans on grace. And mm-hmm. so does, it's, it's the Keras yeah. derivative. And so they're like, we're doing this by the grace of God, right? I mean, that's what Kerito says, I am a Christian by the grace of God, cares grace. And then like the Yule Pistis, right? Um, that means hope. And so Yule Pistis says, I too am a Christian having been freed by Christ and by the grace of Christ, I partake of the same hope. Mm. So maybe that's um, a literary device yeah. by the author or maybe it's like their name that they, they were given is mm-hmm. actually like finding its fulfillment in their life. Yeah. You know, um, which could be cool. Um, kind of like is their their new identity in Christ is like what they're going to be known for. For, you know, yeah. we don't necessarily have their, their birth names right. in here. And so this is what they're going to be known for is what God did in them. Yeah. And even in their name. Yeah. And then you brought up a great point about Payon not being asked if he's a Christian and just standing up and being like, hey, yeah, I too am a Christian. Yeah. He's just chilling there and maybe he's in the court and he just decides he's inspired by, by the boldness of others, like you were talking about. So yeah. I don't know. I just can like see myself and like I know that I <laughs> I would love to have that kind of like boldness. But I think in my mind I could see how you could rationalize and be like, well, the church has to continue after these guys are gone. So I, I'm gonna be I'll 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 be around for the rest of the church. And you could easily do that. But like that, I mean obviously like God stirred something in him in that moment. And you're like, I got to, I got to speak up. Yeah. I don't know. Um, For chapter four, I already talked about one thing, but one other thing that I wanted to, to look at is in the middle of the chapter where Rusticus, the prefect said, let us then now come to the matter. And he's like, enough of this, enough of this. All right, let's just get down to it. And he gives them one more opportunity to sacrifice to the gods or they're going to be tortured. And Justin, who's staring death in the face, Mm -hmm. says no right-thinking person falls away from piety to impiety. No right-thinking person would do this. So it's really interesting. Like the the world would look at that and be like, no right-thinking person would allow themselves to be tortured to death. Just right. sacrifice and it'll be all right. Yeah. And Justin's like, no, you're not thinking correctly. Mm. If we're thinking correctly, it's it's like 
delayed gratification stuff. You know, this is going to hurt. There's this amazing scene in uh, the movie Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, that came out a few years ago with uh, Jim Caviezel starring Luke. And um, in that movie, Luke is talking to some kids and uh, y- young Christians who are about to be killed for Christ. They're awaiting this. And Luke counsels them by saying, like, it's only going to hurt for a little bit, just a little bit. And then you're going to be, like, right there with Jesus. He's trying to help them think rightly. Mm -hmm. You know, now, it's not that Justin is just going to be beheaded. Rusticus is like, you're going to be scourged first. So that can be like the cat of nine tails things. Um, it's the 40, 39 lashes. Um, but it, it could be with rods we, or it could be cat of nine tails. But so this is not a quick thing. That is not going to be a quick thing in one sense of one way, manner of thinking. But over the course, when you compared that to everlasting, yeah, it's a blink of an eye. Yeah. And so we have to like really believe that Jesus is going to give us the grace to stand in that moment, the grace to say what we need to say, the grace for boldness. We need to be praying for that um, and depending on him, in those moments, what were you gonna say? Oh, I was just like, I mean, I, I believe that God is a very forgiving God, and He knows that we are very, you know, weak a lot of the time. But I think that for um, someone who really wants to honor God with their life, that missed opportunity is something that you would just like play in your head a lot. You know what I mean? Like you would. If you chose the, uh, you know, the quote unquote weak way out or the, you know, to back away, you're just going to, you know, you miss this opportunity to stand with Jesus, to suffer with Christ. And like, I, I don't ever look forward to suffering. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not something I, I know in my head, I know it's, it's something that we should be okay with and we should embrace because we're you know, it's something that Christ went through, but uh, I think that we have to keep this long-term mindset and that, you know, this is a temporary thing. It made me kind of like the the next line or through prayer, we can be saved on account of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, right after he's being threatened with being mercilessly punished, that makes me think of, um, and I'm gonna misquote it, but Matthew 10, 28, you know, those who can destroy the body, but you don't know, fear those. Don't fear those who can destroy the body. Yeah, but, but rather but, fear the one. Yeah, who can destroy both mm-hmm. body and soul in hell. Yeah, you would have yeah. you quoted that much better than I would have off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean that's that's who our judge is. That's who we have to worry about. You you can only do so much to me. You think that what you're doing is, you know beyond what I can imagine, but like I have a God who's going to, you know, take care of me and who's going to, you know, reward the faithfulness. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of making me think about Stephen in Acts 7, Mm -hmm. how many of the Jews could be looking at this guy who's clearly brilliant. Mm -hmm. Stephen is brilliant. And remember, like no one could stand up to him uh, when he was debating folks, uh, when he was given defenses for the gospel. And um, so they're having to come up with like false accusations, right? Saying that he's blaspheming the temple, things mm-hmm. like that. So some people could be looking at Stephen and being like, what a waste. What a waste of a life, man. You're dying at a young age. when You could be doing incredible things, man. What a waste. What a, what a disgraceful way to die. Mm. But then you think he sees Jesus rise from the right hand of God the Father, stand up, 
it's almost like a standing ovation type of thing. It's like, look, I see Jesus standing mm -hmm. at the right hand. Not sitting, standing. And so, though the world might think this is wasteful and pitiful and weak, it just makes me remember Psalm 116, this verse that says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. What would you do? If bone of bone betrayed you just to save their own It's coming around, it's coming around